Welcome back guys, it's time for another lesson. This one is on chapter 18, Magnetic Fields. I wanted to remind you before we get into magnetic fields about this thing we've learned about recently called the electric field. So the notion of the electric field is I have a, a charge somewhere that produces an electric field at other points in space. And the electric field can be computed, as you know, by multiplying the Coulomb constant, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, by the charge, divided by the distance to the charge squared, times a unit vector that points from the charge to the point where you want to compute the field. So you get a field that points away from the charge if it's positively charged, and of course it points toward the charge if it's negative. And this is a I call this a, a pointy field. Uh, some people with a fancier mathematical terminology might call it a divergent field. But it's a field where the field vectors point away from the charge, kind of like a, uh, a porcupine. Okay. Now the magnetic field is a different beast altogether. The magnetic field is an inherently curly field. It wraps around the charge in a way, the way that we'll get to here in a second. But it's, uh, it's got a similar expression. There's a constant. The constant is a very different constant. In MKS units, the constant works out in the, for the electric field to be 9 times 10 to the 9 in units of Newton uh, per coulomb. Let me... Uh, excuse me. 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Now, the magnetic field... Uh, has a constant that in MKS units turns out to have a magnitude of 10 to the negative 7. So it's something on the order of 16 times, 16 orders of magnitude smaller for uh, at least in MKS units. Now there's still a charge, there's still an R squared, but the difference is now there's a factor of the velocity involved. So you can see it's the velocity crossed into R hat. So it doesn't point in the direction of r hat. In fact, it points perpendicular to r hat. It points in a direction perpendicular to r hat and perpendicular to the velocity vector. The velocity vector is the velocity of the charge in the frame of reference in which you're computing the field. So the field is going to depend on the motion of the charge. And a motionless charge produces no magnetic field at all. It has to be a charge in motion in order to make a magnetic field. If you work that out for the diagram shown here, the, uh, the magnetic field turns out to point into the board. If you point your fingers of your right hand in the direction of V and wrap them into um, um, R hat, you get a magnetic field, I'm sorry, that points out of the board. The dot corresponds to out of the board. And if you do that for a few other places, you'll notice that on the left of the velocity vector, as shown here, the magnetic field points out of the board. But on the right-hand side, it points into the board. If you uh, get an r-hat that points to the right, v cross r-hat is going to end up pointing into the board. And so you can see that the magnetic field points out of the board on the left, and then it comes around and points into the board on the right. So the magnetic field lines sort of circulate around the velocity vector in a way. And we'll see some three-dimensional diagrams. Actually, I'll show you one right now. <clears throat> Here's a diagram that illustrates the way in which the magnetic field lines circulate around the direction of motion. And uh, you can also see the same picture. It's essentially what's on the cover of the textbook. Another thing I want to point out is because of the 1 over r squared and because of the cross product, the magnetic field dies off quickly if you're not in the plane perpendicular to the charge itself. In other words, the plane in front and the plane back, notice the magnetic fields are much smaller. They're much smaller not only because they're farther away, the r squared, but they're also smaller because the cross product introduces a sine of theta between r hat and v, and the sine of theta has a maximum when r hat is perpendicular to v. But if you're forward or behind the charge, you get a sine of theta that's uh, less than 1. Okay, let's remind ourselves about the cross product. I stole these slides from... Uh, my lesson in uh, Physics 153, the, the first semester of calculus-based physics that deals with torque and rotation. Uh, 
but the cross product is the cross product. It works the same now as it did there, so I can just steal those slides. The first thing I want to remind you of is that if you've got a counterclockwise angle between A and B, the cross product points out, and if you've got a clockwise angle between C and D, C cross D points in. That also means that A cross B points one way and B cross A points in the opposite direction. So the cross product is not commutative with respect to multiplication, it's anti-commutative. You get the opposite when you multiply in the opposite order. The other thing is um, the cross product is always perpendicular to the plane that holds the two vectors in the cross product. So in our case, the velocity and the r hat vector form a plane. The magnetic field is always perpendicular to that plane. You can use the fingers of your right hand to help um, figure out which way the cross product points. Of course, r cross product is v cross r hat, not r cross p. But the, the diagram still works. You just replace the r vector with the v vector and the p vector with the r hat vector, and you get the b vector. And uh, the other thing is, uh, if there's a relationship between the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector, we'll see this again in a little bit, but uh, if, if the uh, velocity or if the magnetic field lines circulate around in a way that you're like the fingers of your right hand, then the velocity vector is in the direction of your thumb. So that's a quick way, using your right hand again, to relate the curling of the magnetic field lines and the velocity vector for a positive charge. Okay. Also, just as a reminder, if you have a magnetic field that points into the page, the easiest way to denote that is with X's. Those are the tails of uh, the feathers of the tails of the vectors sticking out of the page. And if they're pointing out of the page, you use dots. Those are the tips of the arrows pointing out of the page. At least that's the way I think about it. Another point is you can use algebra to do cross products. If we define unit vectors that point in the x, the y, and the z direction, in this case I'm using i hat, j hat, and k hat because that's the way the calculus book at UND denotes unit vectors that point in the x, y, and z direction, then uh, you can see that i hat cross j hat is equal to k hat and j hat cross i hat is equal to minus k hat. And with those two rules, you can see that there are similar rules for uh, if you permute these guys by one, i cross j is k, j cross k is i, and k cross i is j, and uh, the converse is j cross i is minus k, j cross k cross j is minus i, and i cross k is minus j. Then you simply write down, and of course any vector crossed into itself, a unit vector crossed into itself, or any other vector crossed into itself gives you zero. So then you can write down two arbitrary vectors and compute their cross product by just going through all the uh, combinations of i, j, and k crossed together. And what you get is a uh, fairly simple result that uh, where the i hat, j hat, and k, or x, y, and z components of the cross product are produced by the uh, other components, for example, the x component has y and z components in it of a and b. The y component has z and x components of a and b, and so on. Um, if a and b only have x and y components, in other words, they're in the plane of the page, then the cross product only has a z component, because it has to be perpendicular to both of the vectors. And uh, you can write that out in shorthand using the angle bracket notation uh, in a similar way. The other thing I wanted to point out is about the magnitude of the cross product. Let's say I have a vector A and a vector B. Let's imagine that we pick our coordinate system in which A is in the x direction and B is in the x and y direction. So B is going to have x component of B cosine theta and a y component of B sine theta. Theta is the angle between A and B. Then the cross product using that recipe that we just worked out has only a z component, which happens to be equal to a, b, sine, theta. So the magnitude, and this is true, uh, the magnitude of the cross product is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of theta, no matter what coordinate system a and b happen to be expressed in.
it's just easiest to see that result in this particular uh, combination. Okay, so what happens if I have lots of charges, not just one charge going through space? A common case is a, a, a swarm of electrons all moving in the same direction with a more or less uniform velocity, like in a metal. If I have a chunk of metal with an electric field, the electrons are going to run down the metal like a herd of turtles and march their way from one end to the other. Um, if you wait around for a moment, you'll notice that the electrons that were confined to one region uh, start to pierce, start to pass through that region and go out um, the end of that region. And the degree to which they adventure beyond the bounds of the region is dependent upon their velocity and how long you wait. So the extent of that uh, excursion is the velocity times the change in time. Say, give this change in time, let's imagine it's small. You can think of this in three dimensions as like a cylinder of a piece of wire and you're watching the electrons sort of pour through one end of the wire. And uh, what I want to point out is that the current of electrons flowing out of the end of the wire is equal to the charge divided by the time. That's the definition. The amount of charge that goes out one end divided by the time it took to go there. But the point is that that's equal to the number of charges times the amount of each charge, the elementary charge in this case. But the other point is that the number that escape is the number density, the number per unit volume, times the volume of that little uh, cylindrical slab. Well, that volume is the area of the slab times the extent of the excursion, which is the velocity times the change in time. Now, if I put that expression for the number that go through the door back into the current, you'll notice that the delta t's cancel, that the number that escape and the time it takes for them to escape are proportional to each other. And so the current, which is the number per unit time, is independent of the time. And all I get, assuming the velocity is constant and the number density is uniform, I get an expression for current that just depends on the speed of the carriers, the charge of the carriers, the number per unit volume, and the cross-sectional area of the wire. So that's a very handy result. And the point of that is if you go back to the magnetic field expression, you'll remember that it's got a Q times V in it. If I have more charges, I simply multiply Q times V by the number of charges that I have. But the number of charges times Q times V happens to be a piece of the current equation. In fact, if you go back and look at it, you'll see that that is simply equal to the length of the little piece times the number density times the cross-sectional area times the charge times the velocity, but that's just the length of the piece times the current. So if you've got current flowing through a piece of wire, the number of charges times the charge of each one times their speed is exactly equal to the current carried by the wire times the length of the little piece of wire. So that turns out to be a very practical and useful realization. Now if I uh, take a piece of wire and lay it over a compass so that... Uh, the magnetic field produced by the wire affects the direction of the compass needle. Um, remember that the magnetic field lines circulate around the wire so that the magnetic field at the compass is going to be perpendicular to the direction of the uh, current in the wire. Now this particular picture shows the current moving from left to right mostly and uh, the point is if you lay the, the the wire over the compass so that it's along the north-south line and you know that the uh, magnetic field of the earth points along the north direction and the, let's say in this example the magnetic field of the wire is going to be pointing to the left then the needle is going to point in the direction of the net magnetic field it's the direction of the sum of the earth's magnetic field plus the wire's magnetic field but the cool thing about that is, I can measure the angle of the compass needle. If I know the Earth's magnetic field, I can then go backwards and calculate the field produced by the wire. Of course, if I know the field produced by the wire, I can work backwards again 
and figure out the current flowing in the wire. So this is a crude current meter, and we're going to use it in the laboratory to measure current exactly that way. Now I started going through a calculation in class, I want to go through it in more detail here, of the magnetic field produced by such a wire. So imagine we have a wire, a distance x from a point where we want to calculate the field. And we're going to calculate the field produced by the charges moving in this wire. So I just used the definition of the magnetic field that we already worked out. It's sort of like Coulomb's law for the magnetic field. And uh, I've got the constant, mu0 over 4 pi, which remember in MKS units is 10 to the negative 7. Um, I've got the number of charges in the wire, um, in a little chunk of wire, times the charge in each chunk, times the velocity of the charges crossed into r hat, all divided by r squared. Now, the thing is, that first product, the number of charges times the charge in each guy times the velocity, remember that turns out to be nothing other than the current times the length of the wire. So I first make that substitution. The current in the wire, I'm going to presume, is constant. Okay? And uh, then the next thing is I need to put in what delta L is, and I need to put in what R hat is. So delta L, of course, in this case, you can see from the picture, is just delta Y. And r hat has uh, x over r, that's the cosine of theta, and then minus y over r, that's the, uh, that's the sine of theta. But it, you can see r hat points down, so that's why we get a minus y over r. Then uh, putting all that in and taking the cross product, I get that the magnetic field points into the page in this picture, and it's equal to x delta y over r. Then I'm going to go ahead and integrate that. Now the picture shows L over minus L over 2 to plus L over 2 in, just in the sake of getting the answer that I'm interested in, which is a long wire. I'm going to assume that L becomes very long. In this case, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if I plug all that in, I get this integral, dy over r cubed. But uh, you can make a substitution. Let cosine theta be x over r and sine theta be y over r. You go ahead and complete that. You get an expression for dy, an expression for y, and uh, plug all that in. You'll notice that um, you get a secant squared upstairs, but a secant cubed downstairs. And, of course, um, that's amazing because it ends up being just an integral of cosine. And when the smoke clears, that whole integral is just 2. And when you multiply it all out, you get a simple final result. So you get the magnetic field just depends on the distance from the wire. It's a uniform going around, and it looks something like this. So the magnetic field doesn't depend on where you are along the length of the wire. It just depends on how far you are from the wire, if the wire is long and straight. So um, the other thing I wanted to point out is I mentioned before is that if you wrap your fingers around in the direction of the uh, magnetic field, your thumb will point in the direction of the current. And notice also, um, this is emphasized in the book, I just wanted to point it out again, the current is the direction of Q times V. If Q is negative, but V points in the opposite direction, then it's the same as if Q is positive and, and V points in the original direction. In other words, negative charges moving to the left are exactly equivalent as far as the magnetic field is concerned, as positive charges moving to the right. So we often contemplate positive charges, even though we know in reality, in most metals, the free conducting particle is an electron, which has a negative charge. So we'll, have, we'll imagine positive charges moving from high potential to low potential, even though we know in reality it's negative charges moving from low potential to high potential. I'm going to do one more example. Uh, that's an example of a ring and the magnetic field produced by a ring. It's an easy one because the magnetic field turns out to be parallel to the axis. The perpendicular components cancel because as you go around the ring, those po components all uh, uh, point in opposite directions and add up to nothing. And uh, I'll just step through the integral real quick. The, the cool thing is, of course, um, theta is a constant in this case. so everything basically comes out of the integral. So that means r is a constant, uh, and then that 
uh, dl it just gets integrated around the loop and so the integral of dl of course is just the circumference of the root loop which is 2 pi r so you put all that in and you get a very simple result the sine of theta um, you can see is nothing other than uh, r divided by little r and so it simplifies down to um, the area of the loop times the current which that particular product has another name. It's called the magnetic dipole moment of the loop. It's the area times the current times 2 divided by r cubed times the constant. And you'll notice there's a remarkable similarity between that and our dipole formula from the electric dipole. So that's it for this time. I uh, hope, hope that helps you guys, and we'll see you in class.